vlog entitled Baby Boomers and the End of Civilization was demonetized, despite being somewhat popular. I think it was because I mentioned an alternative to alcohol that begins with a D, and the perfectly normal human activity which begins with S. So in this vlog, when I refer to them, I will say D and S. Uh, but herein lies a part of what I'm concerned about. In censoring talk of what are perfectly normal and everyday activities, uh, could this actually be affecting our behaviour? Uh, whilst consumption of D appears to be increasing, uh, partaking in S seems to be decreasing. Uh, something of a watershed for me was my ability to get to see my mother when she was dying. And now I did eventually see her before she died, uh, but not without some considerable trouble, time and expense, and I ought to add, massive emotions. In fact, if you look at everything that I needed to do to go and see her, it took me over 18 months. Uh, whatever the, the reason, and of course our betters would point to health, uh, but it cannot be justified to prevent people from visiting their dying parents and attending their funerals. Surely these along with marriage and births are very human activities. If we cannot organise our society to allow us to engage in these very human activities, uh, then we must question if there is not something uh, deeply wrong with our society. As you will have gathered, this is a very personal reflection. I'm not attempting to prove anything from my own personal experience, uh, just to share it with you, in the hope that it has some resonance with you. And should you share my concern, uh, just maybe our collective thoughts will help to change our trajectory. As a result of the health crisis, so many everyday activities in Indonesia have gone online, as indeed they have the world over. Uh, we were forced to download uh, digital IDs in order to access most of life's basic things like visiting supermarkets, using public transport and visiting government office. Uh, but just as 10 years ago, nothing worked physically in Indonesia, and now nothing works online. I think the big difference is that 10 years ago, when something was impossible, we simply ignored it. In general, it didn't matter, or if it did, it was always possible to get around restrictions by giving a small amount of money to somebody. Uh, but the digital restrictions are all too often absolute. Even when the systems they come from are inadequate. Indeed, this is a part of the reason why I could not get to see my dying mother. Uh, but these are issues which are being replicated the world over. And now it's impossible to access the most basic goods and, of goods and services without a digital presence. Uh, so when I visited the UK, I had to purchase a UK SIM card simply to do the most basic things. Whereas only three years previously, I could survive on using Wi-Fi hotspots every few days. And even that was largely to keep in touch with my loved ones. Although a part of the need for my SIM card was that I was my mother's executor and everything I needed to do to arrange for a uh, funeral and disposal of her estate could only realistically be done online. Uh, but there were so many simple everyday things that one can no longer do in the UK offline. When travelling from Manchester Airport to Shrewsbury, Transport for Wales would not sell me a bottle of water by using cash, uh, despite the train being a tourist train. Uh, when in Shrewsbury, the baker refused, also refused my cash. And I think this leads me to one of my main points. 
And that it's widely perceived that the only way to meet a potential mate or even a date is online. Uh, that it's no longer acceptable to meet people in bars, clubs, etc. That it is somehow creepy to physically approach potential dates. Now, despite per such perceptions, only 20% of couples in the US actually meet using a dating app. And 5% of married couples met online, although not necessarily by using a dating app. On these apps, males outnumber females by three to one. And therefore, the vast majority of users never get a date by using an app. Indeed, some 45% of people who've used dating apps recently said, uh, who recently said it left them feeling more frustrated than helpful. And now this is in sharp contrast to the perception, and maybe this perception is a result of a guerrilla marketing campaign, uh, that the app users are having S all of the time. Of course, this may be true for some users, but it's a very small minority. Indeed, when speaking of S, some 20% of males have 80% of it. Uh, so this probably applies to dating apps. Indeed, my impressions of apps of these digital marketplaces is they alter the odds to be even more extreme. Now, when I owned my companies in the UK, much of our work was digitising of public services. Although I had no idea that it was actually that, that it was to actually replace face-to-face -face services. Uh, one objection was that the old would be excluded from public services, and that is exactly what has happened. Uh, but my companies also researched internet use and computer literacy amongst the elderly. Uh, what we found was that the elderly were blaming computers and the internet for their exclusion. The, especially the unemployed were concerned that their lack of computer literacy was preventing them from getting a job. Uh, what was apparent was that computers and the internet had become a catch-all for much wider problems in society, in particular ageism. Uh, such attitudes also create a market to overcome people's fears. So the UK became awash with low-level IT courses to solve unemployment. Some may have given the unemployed confidence and had a positive effect. Indeed, sometimes as a part of my research, we would do just little introductions to the internet and computers for the people we were speaking to. Uh, but in general, knowing how to boot up a laptop is hardly going to overcome ageism and a host of other cultural imperfections within the labour market. Indeed, these imperfections are now having a marked effect on the UK's future economic growth, or lack of it. Uh, this is important because the assumptions about the UK's welfare state are based on an ever-increasing economic gro growth, including ever-increasing participation in the labour market. Uh, what I'm saying is that there exist deep-rooted problems in society, problems probably created by tribalism and exclusion. And digitisation, far from addressing these, is actually making them insurmountable. So some reflections which are based on my very own personal experience. I've no doubt that I'm an empath. I've always believed myself to be socially awkward and lacking in self-confidence, even though that's not at all how others perceive me. Certainly, I prefer my own company to crowds. Uh, but like most of us, there are times when I am in crowds and I sometimes enjoy myself. I wonder, however, if my feelings are less to do with my personality, that my social awkwardness and lack of confidence simply reflects the put-down of others. Uh, that far from being abnormal, such feelings are normal, especially when we're young. 
People of my age, when presented with the problems of youth, will always say, we did this or this happened to us, followed by, it never did us any harm. But is this true? I recall massive self-doubt and personal torment about re uh, interacting with others. Can you remember moving schools, maybe moving to a new city? And the massive reluctance you felt in developing new social circles. I'm sure this is completely normal. As a teenager growing up in rural Shropshire, or Salop as it was known then, uh, dances were organised into villages by youth clubs and other such organisations, most of which have long since gone. Uh, they involved males lining one side of the village hall and females the others. Uh, the objective was to pluck up the courage to ask a female to dance with you. Even though we no longer really danced together, just moved around to the latest hits from Tamla Motown. If successful, this might result in a few stolen kisses outside of the village hall. Maybe even more. Uh, but the way to access this was to walk across the dance floor and to take the consequences of potential public rejection. Yes, it was incredibly stressful for males and probably for females who were trying to get somebody to ask them for a dance. In towns and cities, commercial organisations such as the Mecca Group had applied Fordism to the village dance interspersed with plastic palm trees and bounded by tartan carpets. Assembly lines of males and females formed on either side of this, these huge entertainment factories. But far from resolving the anxiety, these factories only increased it. Uh, they offered Dutch courage in the form of tartan bitter so we could at least overcome our anxiety to forget the purpose of us being there. Even Tartan Bitter was a triumph for the application of Fordism to our le leisure time, uh, mass producing a chemical mixture that would change our perceptions and having at least a passing resemblance to beer. Uh, for a good many of my generation, maybe all, uh, these inter entertainment factories, despite their glitter, were somewhat seedy and created even more anxiety than the village halls. It's probably for this reason that I was attracted to Wigan Casino. Here, dancing to black soul music replaced the need to dance with another. Uh, Dees replaced Tartan Bitter. And whilst some anxiety still existed, it was given... It was much lower given the removal of the objective of talking to potential mates. Now I sometimes did meet partners in Wigan's casino and others as a result of going there. Uh, but it was much more natural, much less forced. Maybe this is the attraction that I and a good many females felt towards gay clubs. You see the raison d'etre of the village hall dance had been removed or at least subverted. Uh, later I recall parties where either as a result of alcohol or D's I would bump into partners. Uh, not remembering until what had happened until I woke up in the morning in a strange bed. Had I found the courage to approach partners? Maybe. But I couldn't remember what had happened. Uh, maybe I had been approached by partners. And this could at least be a part of the reason why I've seemed to pick up so many narcissists in my life. Uh, just maybe this also tells us something about dating apps. That those who are most successful are either the most predatory or the most susceptible to predatory behaviour. What I am arguing is that I doubt if there ever was a golden age of self-confidence. Certainly some 89% of singles choose not to date because they believe that they're not good at flirting. 
And every innovation which appeals to our reluctance to socialise actually reduces our socialising, even though they appear to provide a solution. Am I arguing that this has now reached a crisis point? Maybe I am. For all advanced countries, with the exception of Israel, the birth rate is now well below self-replacement levels. And this appears to be having a dramatic effect on their economies. In particular, a rise in the dependency ratio. Although certainly initially a reduction in birth rates does have a positive effect on e- uh, a positive economic effect. Furthermore, often GDP per capita actually increases, suggesting that a simplistic interpretation cannot be used. Uh, what I can say is that some massive changes in the economy and social attitudes will be required. I'd planned for receiving my pension this year, but now it's been pushed back to the next year. Uh, Like us all, I require a degree of certainty when planning for retirement. Uh, But then I'm effectively unable to work or conduct business in Indonesia. Uh, Like so many people near retirement age, even if I was in the UK, I'd find it hard to secure a job, which actually increases my wealth and improves my lifestyle. Uh, But maybe the biggest change in social attitudes required are those towards immigration, uh, particularly in East and Southeast Asia. After all, I'm effectively not allowed to work in Indonesia, and even if I was, I would be unlikely to be offered a job, other than perhaps teaching English in Jakarta. Uh, The decline is most apparent in South Korea, uh, Puerto Rico and Singapore, Uh, with Puerto Rico experiencing the greatest absolute decline. But Italy, Cyprus, Greece and Portugal are are very low. Uh, Those countries with healthy replacement rates are all in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, Nevertheless, this does mean that for the next 50 years, the world's population will continue to increase. However, even India, Indonesia and South Africa are heading towards this crisis. Indeed, some 70% of countries on Earth are below the population tipping point. Historically, population collapse is not unknown. Indeed, after World War I, uh, birth rates fell well below replacement levels in the West. In the long run, populations have returned to a growth trajectory. Indeed, only a few years ago, we were concerned about a population explosion. However, the current scale of the population decline is perhaps unique. Would it be unfair to blame this on dating apps? Yes, most certainly, despite my title. Uh, Would it be unfair to solely blame this on technology? Probably. Uh, Like computer literacy and employment, uh, these are more symptoms than causes, but they will contribute. And this leads me to my real issue with what has happened If society can no longer replicate itself, there is something very wrong with society itself. Rather like being unable to visit my dying mother. Whatever the reason, surely they should make us stop and say, what is the point of anything if we cannot fulfil these basic human needs? Uh, Now what is interesting is not so much that people are having fewer children, Uh, but that a good many are now childless, as many as 40% in South Korea and 30% in many Western countries. It would seem that these people are people who plan to have children, uh, but kept putting it off. In fact, people uh, people have one child, who do have one child, are much more likely to have another. Uh, What are the issues putting people off having children? Well, it would seem pushing back our adulthood and therefore our parenthood. And and most will point to economic pressure, but maybe this simply reflects the trend of putting off adulthood. Nevertheless, I, like so many of us, had to move from my home in Shrewsbury for university and then employment. So I moved away from the social infrastructure that's required to support children. 
atomising myself until my income was sufficient and more importantly I at least had some free time to contemplate a family. Certainly some 80% of females are childless for what could be called timing and circumstances. But what are these financial pressures? Uh, well, we're told that we need so many products and services, trinkets as I call them. Certainly they're designed to satisfy our desire and not our needs. Many will actually harm us. We're even told that having no children is better for the environment. Although fortunately few of us believe this. But tell me, how does societal collapse benefit the environment? At the other end of the life cycle, so many of the old die lonely. Uh, you might accuse me of abandoning my mother. Certainly her family did. And whilst, yes, I was severely restricted by the health crisis, I do have to accept some blame. In moving from the village hall to the town's mecca dance hall, then Wigan Casino, and finally overseas, aren't I engaging in the individualism of the baby boomers? In my own way, I replicated the dating apps, seeing the world as my oyster or a sweet shop of potential partners. The commercialisation of human relationships would be another way of putting this. Rather than restricting myself, my search to the village girls, as my mother always encouraged me to do. Uh, but such attitudes set up unrealistic expectations, which seems to be behind the imperfections in the labour market that I've also alluded to. Uh, but the childless don't even get an opportunity to die away from their family. In so many countries, we're increasing the age of consent. And now it would be too controversial for me to argue against this. Uh, but maybe I should simply point out that by 18, females have passed their peak fertility. I believe this to be important because how we organise society and our values are conspiring against natural replacement. It's well known that Japan is facing a dating crisis. I've seen some estimates that suggest that 40% of young males and 30% of females in Japan shun relationships. Indeed, 40% of J Japanese young men have never been on a date, with half of, of singles not being interested in heterosexual relationships. And nevertheless, the definitions behind su such statistics are notoriously problematic particularly when looking at international comparisons. And the Washington Post has pointed to contrary statistics that indicate Japanese youth are having S more frequently than ever. Uh, but I've also come across estimates of some 30% in advanced economies. In fact, nearly half of US adults, not simply young people, are not currently seeking a relationship. Although some very reliable data from Canada suggests that, young, that for young people it's only around 12% and that includes both voluntary and involuntary. Uh, this seems to be related to ghosting whereby people break off contact with potential partners, even the outside world. Another indication of the atomization of the individual and certainly I, for one, am guilty of this. Um, despite these figures from Japan, um, it, would, it is only the third loneliest country in the world, with the UK and Sweden being higher. Surely this is having a dramatically negative effect on the psychology of the world's population. Certainly in my adopted country, Indonesia, and 90% of young people disapprove of S before marriage. Uh, but perhaps this is influenced by regular threats to criminalise such relationships. Uh, this is compared to only 6% in France. Uh, social media does have to take some responsibility for these trends. I've often talked about how atomised and isolated social media seems to be making us all. 
uh, to such a degree that the title social is a misnomer when it should be called anti-social media. I've previously discussed how the algorithms of social media promote extreme views and this is leading to an explosion in narcissism. Uh, but even at a mundane level, far from promoting social interaction, social media is increasingly leading us to stay at home on our smartphones. I'm sure I've heard, but I cannot trace the reference, that in the UK 30% of young people no longer visit pubs. Uh, perhaps an even higher proportion of us reluctant to approach a potential partner in the workplace for fear of being accused of harassment. Again, this points to a major division between serial harassers for whom society probably does need protection and the rest of the population who maybe needs some encouragement. In fact, in the US, nearly half of all adults believe that dating has become harder over the last 10 years, with male Americans in particular citing fears over S harassment. Of course, the health crisis has exacerbated these trends, and maybe that was the very point. So if social media is the exact opposite of what it actually purport purports to be, could we include dating apps within this? Could it be that dating apps actually lead to less dating rather than more? Well, it certainly seems that way. For like social media, their raison d'etre is to keep you online and not meeting partners. As I've said, the ratio of males to females is 3 to 1. Uh, but there are many examples in which these females aren't even humans, but AI bots. Certainly, virtually all photos and messages could be described in some way as catfishing. So the vast majority of males never get a date from a dating app. Uh, this leads to even more opportunities to use AI and bots. Uh, Bot-generated messages asking males to pay extra for a seemingly genuinely female. But what this really points to is that dating apps are simply selling us back our own dreams, not giving the ability, yes, the ability to realise our dreams. What's more, because these dating apps favour the narcissist and permissive, users are not unnaturally guarded on their first date, choosing venues that are most unlikely to wake up in a strange bed, wondering what has happened. Uh, like so many products and services in modern society, dating apps actually do the exact opposite to what they say they're supposed to do. Uh, with the development of the metaverse and virtual accumulation, we're moving further and further away from social contact and more and more towards atomised individuals within smart cities. In fact, the 15-minute cities are being promoted, originating from the health crisis in France. It's now widely promoted in the UK and other parts of the West. Uh, that everything we should want should be within 15 minutes of us. Uh, but the potential sting being that we could be penalised when more than 15 minutes from our homes. Uh, thinking of my teenage socialising, this would have restricted me to the odd village dance and never visiting the town's Mecca dance hall, let alone travelling 100 kilometres to Wigan. For me, the health crisis prevented me from visiting shopping centres or using public transport, and the restrictions on visiting government offices prevented me from leaving the island of Java, let alone Indonesia. Indeed, for three years I kept finding myself in the wrong part of Java, unable to move. Even today, when the rest of the world has removed restrictions, I have to wear a mask on the MRT, I'm, and I'm not allowed to talk to anyone. A mask wearing is also compulsory in many shopping centres. Now, what are the deep-rooted psychological issues arising from this lack of human contact? Uh, well, nobody is studying it. Um, but what I have noticed is that Jakarta is a much less friendly city, uh, that people are more suspicious of strangers, uh, which my skin colour will always mark me out as. 
Uh, but are these natural reactions to no longer being able to trust anyone? That so many of our interactions are now with bots, uh, that the news is sometimes blatantly untrustworthy, not simply social media, um, that so many of us now even doubt everything we are told. Whilst it is convenient to blame social media, uh, dating apps and the response to health crisis, and all must shoulder some blame, uh, but maybe the real villain is the assumptions of the Enlightenment, which see everything as machine, including people. Or as my friend Luckman commented, that the uh, in object orientated programming, even the individual is now the object. So my real argument is that we design products, services and systems based on inhuman assumptions. Uh, like how the Mecca dance halls replicated the village halls. Uh, they replicated the very worst elements of the village hall, pursuing economies of scale uh, rather than fulfilling human needs. Indeed, just like Fordism dehumanises work and human creativity, the Fordist leisure complexes dehumanised our leisure. Are we really talking about dating? Aren't we really designing systems for young people who have completely different hormonal makeup to the designers? Uh, the big danger is in seeing humans as machines as we define simple solutions to simple problems. So the solution to loneliness is seen as a dating app when I've already shown that they actually increase loneliness. Isn't it time to call a halt and question these inhuman assumptions? Because I for one fear that time is rapidly running out. As these are the assumptions informing AI, which we're increasingly unable to question. <laughs>